I, I think it's just transparently bullshit. You know, I mean, if you haven't seen it, it's because you're choosing not to look. You know, it's kind of this, you know, Schrodinger's war crime. If we don't look inside, then maybe it didn't happen. But we have seen evidence. We can see with our own eyes um, because in part because Israeli soldiers have this strange tendency to film themselves doing these things. With the U.S. elections just weeks away and with Israel's war on Gaza and now Lebanon continuing with no end in sight, we're speaking to Matt Duss, Executive Vice President at the Center for International Policy. He's also a former foreign policy advisor to Bernie Sanders. We're going to speak about America's Gaza policy and how these wars are impacting the U.S. race for president. And he joins us now from the U.S. Matt Duss, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us on Real Talk. Very glad to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Matt, I want to start off, um, you know, what are your reactions to everything that's going on right now? I mean, obviously Gaza, but also Lebanon. I mean, where is the U.S. in all of this? I mean, the U.S. is where it has been, not just for the past year, but for a very long time, which is uh, squarely and unconditionally, it seems, um, behind uh, what Israel is doing. Its policy, obviously, in Gaza, in the occupied territories, with some exceptions. Um, but now it seems to be, you know, despite kind of public um, protestations and, you know, efforts to, to you know, quote, de-escalate, um, it seems like the Biden administration has now shifted to support uh, for Israeli escalation in Lebanon and con very concerningly, potentially uh, in Iran. It is, I think, a catastrophic mistake. Um, I, I have written that in the past. I wrote it today in a new piece in the New Republic. I think the last year has been a huge failure of U.S. foreign policy. Um, and we're going to be dealing with the consequences of this, I think, for many, many years to come. It's widely perceived in the region that Israel has been given a carte blanche by the U.S. Um, would you agree with that? I, I think that's what it looks like as well. I think we can see evidence of some kind of behind the scenes pressure um, that have changed at the margins. I think some Israeli you know, procedures, operations, rules of engagement, but on the whole, I think that that impression is correct. Just the United States has continued to funnel massive armed shipments to Israel. Um, it has refused to withhold those, um, except for one specific, um, you know, suspension of 2,000 pound bombs the president announced a few months ago. Um, and all of this going on in ways that clearly violate international humanitarian law um, and also violate U.S. law. I think we've been having a really important and long overdue discussion here in the United States about the laws that govern um, the provision of U.S. military aid to any country um, and the failure of this administration to enforce those laws. Yeah. And even, even for the suspension of the 2,000 pound bombs that you spoke about, I mean, it was followed by a $20 billion package. Yeah, as I said, it was one, one you know, particularly large armament, um, but that was then superseded by, you know, the, the influx of a whole range of other new weapons that were killing just as many people. I think the 2,000 pound bomb is notable because, you know, this idea that this is in any sense a targeted operation, why would you be using 2,000 pound bombs in one of the most densely occupied um, you know, inhabited areas in the world? The fact that it took months for Biden to even do that small thing, I think is itself a condemnation of this policy. Can I ask you, Matt, on a, on a, on a professional, but even on a personal one, uh, if, if you don't mind, you know, how have you been looking at the past year, um, the amount of destru the destruction, the mm -hmm. amount of killing, the ferocity of the strikes that we've seen on Gaza, but also Lebanon most recently. Sure. I mean, well, just having good friends and colleagues in Israel, in Palestine, in Gaza, in Lebanon, I've been watching all this with with fear and, and sadness and, and rising anger. Um, I'm outraged that my government is behaving the way it's behaving. And acknowledging as as I have done from the beginning as I think all all people should the 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 real um the crime against humanity that occurred on October 7 the attacks of uh, by Hamas and others um on Israeli civilians uh, we need to be willing to call that outrageous and a crime which it is um that however does not justify the response that we have seen we also need to be very very clear about that and I've just been, it's 
frustrating to see the debate that occurs here in Washington, which just seems completely detached from reality, where there is, of course, enormous sympathy and support for the people of Israel for what they endured, um, but barely any um, for the people of Palestine or others in the region who are enduring um, far worse. And again, I don't want to create a competition uh, in suffering here. All I'm saying is that if we are serious about upholding human dignity and human security, um, we need to be serious about that and not be selective about that. And unfortunately, U.S. policy reveals a very egregious selectivity about who, about whose lives are valued and whose are not. Mm. And you even, um, I think in one recent interview, you called that it's basically become a war of revenge from the Israeli side. Yes. Yeah, I think that became clear very, very quickly, in part because Israeli government officials were saying this publicly. Yeah. Okay, this is not, we don't have to do a lot of detective work to figure this out. They were saying this very clearly. There, These public statements were, of course, followed by action that reflected these statements. You know, the, the banning of food, water, electricity, um, the continuing restriction of humanitarian aid into the territory. Um, and all of these, you know, many of these statements have, you know, become part of the brief um, that South Africa entered um, charging genocide in the International Court um, of Justice. I mean, these are a clear statement of intent. And yet, um, in Washington, there is still this this kind of denial of reality, because I think to, to really confront that reality and acknowledge it would then, I think, confer responsibility to do a whole set of other things that are hard that are politically difficult, that will create domestic political blowback. But we need leaders and we need, I think, foreign policy professionals who actually take these principles and values seriously enough to confront those political challenges and overcome them. Hmm. I just think of one example as you're, as you're saying that being disconnected from reality. I mean, how do you react when you see press briefings by U.S. officials like John Kirby and others um, who, who yeah. keep repeating the same lines, and one of which yeah. is that we haven't seen evidence of Israeli war crimes. Like, how do you react to that? Uh, we, we don't have any indications that there's d d d deliberate, uh, d deliberate uh, uh, efforts to commit war crimes by the Israeli Defense Forces. Right. I, I think it's just transparently bullshit you know i mean if you haven't seen it it's because you're choosing not to look you know it's kind of this you know schrodinger's war crime if we don't look inside then maybe it didn't happen but we have seen evidence we can see with our own eyes um because in part because israeli soldiers have this strange tendency to film themselves doing these things we can see reporting of course from palestinians on the ground that these things are happening we can see reporting from the overwhelming majority of international human rights organizations, including Israeli human rights organizations, who are very clear that these that these violations of human rights and violations of international humanitarian law are occurring. And I will also say, as someone who has talked and continues to talk with administration officials, they know this is happening. So I, I just, you know, to see Kirby and others stand up there and not be willing to acknowledge that. I think that is both dishonest and dangerous because it really it really undermines con confidence in our government. And again, maybe I'm naive, perhaps I am a little bit, but but I insist that we need to be able to hear the truth from our government. And I know that's not always the case, um, but that is something I'm going to continue to demand as a U.S. citizen. And, and just on that note, the, the conversations that you say you're, you, you've been having, I mean, have you been able to make sense why there appears to be such a disconnect between the Biden mm -hmm. White House and, and what they're saying they're seeing and not seeing and then what the rest yeah. of the world is seeing. Yeah, I mean, I, I go into this a little bit in my piece today, and I've written about it before, as have others. I mean, one is Joe Biden just ideologically is he has declared himself a Zionist. He has always had this specific view of how the U.S.-Israel relationship should work, which is, as I said, essentially unconditional. Um, if there are disagreements and criticisms, they will mostly be communicated behind closed doors. If there's pressure to be brought to bear, it will be done privately, but publicly it's essentially total support. Um, we've seen that change some ways. We've seen, you know, we see these leaks about how Biden is very upset and leaks about how Biden has called the bombing indiscriminate. Um, 
But the bottom line is whatever he thinks or does not think, whatever he said privately or publicly, he has still been almost completely unwilling to actually use real U.S. pressure and U.S. leverage to create any costs whatsoever um, for Netanyahu or for these these clear violations of international humanitarian law. Um, again, I think there are some in the administration who I think do have real questions of whether this would actually succeed in changing Israeli behavior. Um, I think there are others inside the administration and in Israel who have said that if the United States were to suspend military aid, Israel would not be able to continue doing what it's doing, just the amount of ammunition it is blowing through in these in these now multi in this now multi front war, it would have to slow down and eventually stop quickly. I would just say the upside, even if it didn't change Israeli behavior, the fact that the U.S. would no longer be arming this catastrophic war for me is an enormous upside in itself. Yeah, and what I was gonna say is, uh, so if you believe if if we were to have a ceasefire today, or if the U.S. were to use its leverage, that would translate into immediately stopping arming Israel, basically. I don't know if it would translate into immediately stopping, but I but I think that has been the missing piece, the missing element in this equation. We've seen, you know, as of the end of May, Biden made public his ceasefire proposal, which he yes. said had support from the Israeli government, which in, in my understanding is true. The security cabinet uh, did approve that, although unfortunately Netanyahu almost immediately began undermining, as he has done repeatedly, um, not just in this war, but throughout multiple rounds of U.S. brokered negotiations with the Palestinians going back many, many years. Um, you know, and again, this is certainly not to absolve Hamas or absolve uh, Sinwar um, or for, you know, steps they have taken to include new conditions. But I do think it's worth noting that Hamas's key demand has been for a long time that any the ceasefire would end the war. They don't want just a temporary cessation to the war um, after which Israel would go back to, to it. They want to end the war. That is something President Biden put his own weight behind. If you go to his statement on May 31st, I believe, he said it is time for this war to end. And that is what Netanyahu has refused to commit to. And I think we've seen enormous pressure put on Hamas in various ways. Obviously, the war itself uh, being a, a, a serious amount of pressure, but no real pressure, no real costs created for Netanyahu's own refusal uh, to cooperate. Yeah. And I, and I want to talk about that a bit more. And I, I you know, I'm just going to put it into a bit of context. Uh, when it comes to Joe Biden and Yahoo, know, Joe Biden had spoken about red, having red lines in Gaza, right? And then Netanyahu walked mm -hmm. all over that. And then there was previous messaging from the White House that he, that the war on Gaza would end by January 2024. Uh, that obviously hasn't happened. And then there was the, the May or June uh, ceasefire proposal that you just brought up. And then again, Netanyahu walked all over it. Um, and then there was there's another argument, which I think you actually touched upon in your article, that, uh, that Biden's red line is actually not letting uh, the, the war escalate outside of Gaza. And then right. we're seeing that happen in Lebanon and then possibly Iran as well. Um, you know, people keep asking why the U.S. government hasn't changed its tactics. But uh, I, what I want to ask is how can people not be convinced that the U.S. is fully on board with what's happening right now? No, I think that's a very good question now. And as I wrote, I mean, Biden would lay down a series of red lines. Rafa was allegedly one of his red lines. Um, and I think, unfortunately, it became clear that, you know, it, his red line wasn't Rafa per se. His red line was, well, a Rafa invasion could, could you know, ex could force Palestinians to flee into Egypt, um, which would then, you know, m create a much bigger regional problem. Um, once Israel showed that, okay, we're going to corral the Palestinians elsewhere within Gaza as we obliterate Rafa, that turned out to be fine. But I, but I would note that the casualties, the number of killed, wounded, um, and displaced by the Rafa invasion was as bad or worse than the administration feared. I mean, the administration's own humanitarian envoy, David Satterfield, said exactly this. Others have confirmed it. It wasn't that the Israelis figured out a way to go into Rafa that was uh, less devastating is that it's just that this they found a way to make the devastation contained uh, to Gaza. But now even that real red line has appeared, you know, appears to have just been rolled over in Lebanon. President Biden said publicly, we are close to, uh, um, you know, a ceasefire on the northern border. Uh, and Netanyahu responded to that by a massive,
massive bombing campaign that eventually killed um, Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah and a number of top uh, Hezbollah leaders. Um, and now it appears that they are they are gunning for Iran. Yeah. And, and then it begets the question, I mean, what is Biden's endgame here? You previously, you previously said that Biden's uh, Gaza policy is failing. So where, mm -hmm. where does that leave us? I mean, where, where, where does the administration go from here? That is, I think, part of what is so terrifying about this moment is that I don't think they have an endgame beyond, you know, restoring, quote unquote, restoring deterrence, which is one of those terms that Washington foreign policy nerds kind of use to say, okay, we're just going to keep using violence uh, and, and show dominance to the other side. I do think they see an opportunity and, you know, certainly Netanyahu. And first, let's step back for a moment and understand what is driving Netanyahu here. From the beginning, his goal has always been to just prolong this war because he understands that the failure of October 7 is very much on him. It's the one, of the, probably the worst day in Israel's history, a massive um, intelligence failure, a massive security failure. And this has always been his key argument uh, to the people of Israel, which is that maybe you don't agree with me on everything, but I'm the one who can keep you safe. And he understood that to avoid um, you know, his moment of reckoning, his moment of accountability for that, you know, failure, he would need to sustain, prolong, and now expand this war. Um, and I think he has managed, unfortunately, to convince many in Washington, not that Washington needs much convincing, but apparently some people inside the administration that, okay, we are just going to go for it. We're going to reset the table. We're going to decapitate Hezbollah's leadership. We're going to um, weaken Hamas. We're now going to take action against other, you know, Iranian, you know, militant partner groups, whether in perhaps Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and potentially inside Iran itself. And I mean, I commented the other day that the, there are vibes in this city that remind me of, you know, 2006, that that really infamous quote from Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, that what we are seeing is the birth pangs of the new Middle East, which is a sense that, you know, this war may look bad, but it's an opportunity to kind of create a new region to, ex you know, to exploit an opportunity for us to, to use this violence to create a better future. And I just, that is both offensive and just incredibly wrong. And it seems to me that we apparently need to relearn this lesson um now i mean you've also spoken about uh before the, those in dc who have been advocating for a war with iran um mm -hmm. i mean we've also been seeing this reflected in different uh, opinion columns as well but what, what's what's your concern today when that seems a lot closer than it was yeah my concern today is just there really is no real end game if if, if we are simply following netanyahu you know along on this war, as it clearly seems we are doing now, um, what's it going to take um, to hit the brakes on this? We don't you know, we don't seem to have a president who's really interested in, in, in doing that. I've, I also, I've found it interesting uh, seeing neoconservatives uh, like Dick Cheney, for example, come out and endorse mm -hmm. Kamala Harris. Um, yeah. there, there's, there's, there, there's one take that, that I saw that, you know, this could be, in, instead of the, the reason that they say it is, which is saving democracy from Trump, that this could actually be a reason, um, the reason why they would support Kamala is that um, they're, you know, the Democrats are basically facilitating wars that these neocons have always wanted, and one of which is, is a war with Iran. I don't know what you would make of that. Yeah, I, I think that might, you know, I understand why it could look that way. I think that's probably overthinking it a bit. I think the Harris team and the Democratic Party sees some value. I mean, I don't know what this stuff about Dick Cheney is about. I mean, no one needs to be saying anything good about Dick Cheney, neither Vice President Harris I mean, nor Joe Biden. Biden did, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Right, you know, and if you look back, and I think some people were pushing up some, you know, some of what Biden said about Cheney back in 2008, he called him one of the most dangerous politicians in American history, which is accurate, which is true. I mean, as I said, and I'll continue to say, Dick Cheney did more damage to this country and to the world than Donald Trump did. It is not even close. Um, but, you know, I think with regard to Liz Cheney, there is a sense of, okay, here is a Republican who stood up against Trump. She paid a price electorally. Um, and they believe that there is some number of Republican undecided voters who could be swayed to vote Democrat because 
Liz Cheney is endorsing Harris. I mean, I don't know what numbers they've seen. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm skeptical of the idea that there are very many rural Wisconsin voters who are going to be convinced by Liz Cheney's endorsement. But I think it's they want to create a sense that, OK, this is where the new political consensus is. This is where the responsible people are voting. And I get that because I'll just say as horrible, I think, as I think this policy in the Middle East is, I think I, I also understand the stakes in the election and the choice, the binary choice that we face between Trump and Harris. And if the question is, could this get worse? Oh, very much. It could get worse both there and here in the United States. But still, it is kind of frustrating to see, um, you know, you know, them bringing the Cheneys on board, given what the Cheneys, both Liz and Dick, did um, during the war on terror, introducing uh, some really horrible anti-Muslim, anti-Arab invective into our politics, um, now being treated, uh, you know, as heroes simply because, um, you know, they had the courage to stand up uh, against Donald Trump. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get back, I'll come back to this in just a second, but um, I want to read you a tweet, and you touched upon the subject of it just a second ago, but I'd like you to expand. Um, in one of your tweets recently, you said, maybe it's just a coincidence that the people who seem most exultant about Israel's Lebanon escalation yeah. have been the most consistently and stupendously wrong about yeah. the region for the last 20 years. Now, I want you to expand yes. on this. Yeah, I mean, we've always had, I mean, the neocons or whatever term you want to use, we have essentially this kind of permanent war party, a permanent war mentality. It's it's bigger than just the neocons. We do have this very militaristic interventionist mentality in Washington that is in part driven, you know, by the pro-Israel lobby, but it's also driven by the military industrial complex. You have think tanks, scholars, members of Congress who are are funded by all of these interests. Um and, it, you know, I'm not saying they don't believe it, but I think we have a political system, a, a frankly deeply corrupt political system that is dominated by wealthy interests that selects for people with this kind of mentality. Um, and so anytime there's a new war in the offing, you can see this city kind of get revved up. And that is what we are seeing right now. But again, going back to if you look at people, I don't you know need to reel off the list of people, but it's always this kind of very familiar list of people for whom war is almost always the answer. Um, and we need to just show the right amount of toughness. Um, and, and then we can kind of transform the world uh, in a way that accords uh, with our preferences. Yeah. And, and, and where do you see them standing today? Are you seeing them on, on the front line celebrating what's happening, basically? Well, well these, these people are, are never standing on the real front lines. They, <laughs> they're they sitting at their desks and in the green rooms of the various uh, uh, cable TV networks. Um, but no, I mean, you know, people like Lindsey Graham, who's never met a war, uh, you know, he he, he didn't like. Um, you, he, he called for flattening Gaza, didn't he? Flattening Gaza, uh, and that was one of the least you know, offensive things he said. But you've got, again, just a really kind of, especially as it relates to the Middle East, not only though, we've seen obviously the rise of anti-Asian, anti, anti-China anti rhetoric, um, but specifically there's this sense that, you know, the United States has the right and the ability to kill huge numbers of people, um, you know, because we've decided that we're going to create a better, a better outcome uh, this way. And you've got lots of think tanks and, you know, so-called scholars who are always going to be on board to kind of agree that yes, this is a smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just I, I'm just reminded of a quote uh, you gave uh, for a recent interview, and I don't want to go too much on a tangent here, but uh, you know, because where we are today, there's a lot of emphasis on the pro-Israel lobby in the U.S., the military-industrial complex. But you actually had spoken about a, a more personal story of growing up in the evangelical church, and you, you described that you know there is a relationship yeah. with Israel that even stretches beyond those factors that I mentioned. Right. I think that, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up, because when I, you know, when I talk about the pro-Israel lobby, a lot of people just assume that we mean APAC and other groups like that. But the largest pro-Israel constituency in the United States is conservative evangelicals. Um, so this is a community that I grew up in. 
and there's just a sense of you know the creation of the modern state of israel is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy it's a sign of you know the end times and the the imminent return of jesus christ um and so there is just you know it is a and even for people who don't kind of chapter and verse believe in that theology even for people who aren't kind of ardent you know churchgoers regular churchgoers there is a cultural sense of understanding of israel's story it's it's part of our literature it's part of our kind of social and cultural history um and that really that politically that matters it's not a judgment call on there it's just it's the way a lot of americans understand the region we've been exposed to parts of jewish history um in a way that we simply have not been exposed to parts of muslim history arab history palestinian history and again this is my background i it took me you know, I was raised with the Old and New Testament as part of growing up at the Evangelical Church. These were stories that I knew, um, and and kind of that was how I understood the region until I made the effort and was exposed to kind of other people's stories, other people's narratives. And I would that's partly that does help explain why the United States has been so overwhelmingly one sided. It's because a lot of because there is a real political, you know, this this understanding of history does have a real political impact. Mm. And how are you seeing this come to the forefront today in light of everything that's happening, and, and, and including yeah. the U.S. elections? Yeah, I think we just see it reflected in statements from members of Congress and in our media. There is still just an overwhelming sympathy for one side of, of this story. Um, I think that's changing, in, you know, in part because, you know, Palestinians and others in the region have greater tools to kind of narrate their own stories, to report on what is happening. I think we see a greater representation and diversity of voices in our media, in Congress. Um, but it's 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 a big project. Right. Um, yeah, you know, and, this, I, and I, wanna, this, you know, I just want to ask you, because you say you think it's changing, but to what extent do you think it's changing? Do you think it's changing right. to the extent of meaningful change on the ground, politically? Right, that is the key question. When does this actually change policy on the ground? And I do think it's it's hard to overstate the impact of having a president who believes what Joe Biden believes, right? The president is has enormous authority in designing and executing foreign policy. And even though I think we have seen unprecedented criticism from Congress, um, you know, mainly if almost exclusively from Democrats, I would add, um, on suspending aid, on criticizing the policies of occupation, criticizing the, the war in Gaza, criticizing the escalation. I mean, in a lot of ways, we're having a very, very different and I think better conversation on these issues than we've had in a very long time. In fact, you know, the, the fact that we're having a debate within the Democratic Party about suspending military aid to Israel, this would be unthinkable 10 years ago. This was an absolutely taboo subject. No member of Congress would, would really touch this issue um, 10 years ago. And that has that has really changed. And yet we see the limits of, of that um, when trying to deal with an administration that has been as committed as, as this president has to this particular path. But I think this is the process of change. This is what it looks like. Yeah. Um, and I know that's unsatisfying um, to listeners. It is unsatisfying to me, but I do think you know we're continuing the work and continuing to build um, this shift in the party and in policy. I mean, there, there is no other option. Yeah. And, and again, I'm not dismissing what you're saying, but again, back to your point, I do think that the frustration stems from that, yes, whether or not these uh, debates and discussions are unprecedented, they're still not leading to an actual yeah. end to, to, to what's yes. happening today. And I think that's, that's what's frustrating people outside of the D.C. circles. And maybe inside I, and as I well. I share that, uh, yeah. Yes, and again, I, I absolutely share that frustration um, just trying to explain you know, why this is. Um, but again, our task is continue to do the work. That's, it. That's how I see it. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to I wanna ask you about the U.S. Uh, elections right now. I want to pivot to that conversation. Um, you know, with the election, you know, four weeks or less, four weeks or so away, do you really think that Kamala Harris is, is able to distance herself from the Biden administration? I mean, I saw her latest uh, 60 Minutes interview, and, and I, I think that is an example of uh, 
the, the Democrats not willing to change course, basically, mm. or to break mm. away from w with the Biden yeah. administration. Um, I don't see how it changes the perception um, that Arab and Palestinian lives just don't matter to, to the D.C. establishment. Yeah, I mean, I think they have decided that, you know, and first I would say, I don't think anyone should have expected the vice president to like, really distance herself from the policies of the president whose administration she continues to serve. But there was, think, there was that wrote, initial messaging. I, I apologize for cutting you off, but yeah. uh, there was that um, initial messaging um, I think there was a push in the media from her campaign that, you know, she was the one who was talking, you know, in those national security uh, meetings, she was the one who was coming at it from a humanitarian perspective. So I think that there was initially some sort of messaging coming out that Kamala Harris would be different on Gaza. But, you know, as the weeks passed yeah. on, I don't really think that that's solidified. Right. And I think this is also the message that I, they have been trying to share privately is that she will take a different approach publicly, however, as a candidate. She is choosing not to really highlight. I mean, she continues to focus on the humanitarian crisis. Um, you know, she did so in the convention speech uh, in a way that I think was unsatisfying to a lot of people, myself included. But I also noted at the time, you know, that speech, I mean, her whole approach to, to her candidacy right now is to say, is to not get too deep into policy. It's to say, you know, what is the minimum I need to say to appeal to different constituencies and get over the finish line? I get that from just kind of a pragmatic um, political standpoint. I would note that one of those boxes that she did need to check in the convention speech was Palestinian self-determination, um, Palestinian rights. Um, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Now, again, this was not kind of new or surprising language to anyone, um, but it was new to hear from the candidate at the convention. I think that is worth noting. But other than that, she has really not distanced herself from the Biden administration's policy. They seem to have, you know, they'll have these, you know, private engagements as they had recently in Michigan um, with, with Arab American groups. Um, so they do recognize the need to talk to that constituency. They're not giving what I think a lot of representatives want to hear. Um, but they've also decided that they can't, for whatever reason, agree or disagree. And I tend to disagree that there's only so far that they can go, um, you know, not to lose other constituencies in the party, um, other donors in the party. Um, and so that's where we are. And, and I think her convention speech was also overshadowed by the fact that they denied sharing the stage with a Palestinian at the DNC. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. Again, I think a, a, a huge mistake um, should not have been too much to ask. But, um, and I don't know how much of this to put on the vice president herself or just the Democratic Party, um, in which these kind of old views of how we're supposed to approach uh, the Middle East tend to dominate. I, I don't think that the Democratic Party leadership really reflects the change that is happening, clearly happening among the rank and file in the Democratic Party. Is, is the core uh, of the issue with the Harris campaign right now is that Gaza is merely viewed as a foreign policy issue as opposed to mm -hmm. Gaza being viewed as, you know, uh, like a humanitarian or an issue of social and racial justice, for example? Yes, I, I think that is, that's a big part of it. I don't think they've fully grasped and when I say they, it's both, I think, the, the Harris campaign, but also the Democratic Party in general have understood that, yes, as you said, Gaza is, is and Israel-Palestine is more than just a foreign policy issue. Rightly or wrongly, it is seen as an issue of social and racial justice. Um, we've seen, seen this going back many years. I, I think when I first noticed it was, you know, in Ferguson when people were holding up Palestinian flags and you saw messages from Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza in solidarity with protesters in Ferguson. Um, and again, this work has been done um, over many years, work, solidarity work trips by, um, you know, black American activists and scholars and others to Palestine. Um, and I think this, as, as you've probably seen and listeners have probably seen over the past few weeks, ta Coates talking about his new book, um, which I think is, is, is really going to, again, help further shift this conversation because he's approaching this in, a, I think, a, a way that is very direct and very straightforward, which is to say, you know, either you believe in racial equality or you don't. And if you're telling me that you can support this this system of segregation and ethnic domination uh, in Israel-Palestine, then, you know, how can we, you know, 
we need to oppose this everywhere, both in the United States and in Israel, Palestine. And again, we don't, you know, we don't have the ability to simply transform these societies, but we can support a U.S. foreign policy that reflects uh, and really upholds um, a set of principles. Just on that note, how did you react to that viral clip of, I, I think it was a CBS journalist who, who basically yeah. asked him um, that, you know, his, he, he would have expected these words from, from, a, from an extremist, and I'm paraphrasing here, but yeah. he yeah. said something along those lines. I mean, how'd you react when you see that? Yeah. The content of that section mm. would not be out of place in the backpack of an extremist. I'll just put it this way. It's, it was like he was reading off a brochure of talking points. And unfortunately for him, Tanahasi has also read that brochure, um, and so I think was able to respond quite effectively, and you know again bring the conversation back to a set of principles about human dignity, about equality, um, and about anti-racism, um, and that is a place that you know people like that journalist are very uncomfortable having to go. They would like to make it all about terrorism and extremism. Um, but I think what's important also to note is, you know, a Tanahasi having taken the time to go and see the occupation up close, um, and and also working not just and talking not just with Palestinians, although that is very very important, but also to do work with Israelis, who are themselves doing the work to end the occupation to create a better society, because I think when people kind of align themselves with one of the other camps, I think. Sometimes it unfortunately gets okay. Are you pro-Israel? You pro-Palestinian? But I do think it's important to note that there are Israeli Jews who are really committed to to doing all the things that I I think those of us who identify as progressives want. They are they are trying to advance, you know, a more progressive vision for their own society. Um, so I appreciated Tanahasi also rooting. Uh, his analysis and the work he had done with those those people. Yeah, and and how do you see that reflecting on the media climate in the U.S. when it comes to Israel Palestine? Yeah, I think we see the media, you know, climate changing slowly. It is still dominated by just one narrative, but I do think as we have more journalists who are both more educated um, in the realities of Israel Palestine, who have actually taken the time to go there themselves, or in are in touch with colleagues who are from there and can give them a broader perspective, I think we do see um, this this conversation shifting. It takes, again, it's frustratingly slow. Um, but I think if you look, again, having done this work here in Washington for, I think, some 17 years, um, the conversation we are having, you know, in the, in the foreign policy community, in the media, in the Congress, um, is very different. In some ways, it's much more aggressive. Um, you, you, you see a backlash against supporters of Palestinian rights that is very vicious, but I think that itself is a reflection of the progress we've made in lifting up this other narrative. And you're, you're hopeful that, it, that there would be changes in the future. You know, I am, there's the famous Gramsci quote, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Um, that's, that's, I think that, that really captures it. You know, I, I again, I, I'm frustrated as I know many of your your, your listeners are as well about the slow pace of change. But again, having been here for years doing this work, I do see that change happening. Um, and I think the, the, you know, the key is to continue to work, to continue to build this movement, to continue to coordinate and talk, uh, to work with the, our champions in Congress. We have more of those now than ever. Um, and, and just push for the change we want to see. Moving back to the uh, elections, um, you know, I just want to say that I do understand that anger towards the Democrats is not just an Arab or, or, or a Muslim American yes. issue. Um, but I do want to zoom in on the Muslim vote. Um, there was a recent CARE poll uh, which found that uh, Jill Stein is actually leading Harris in three swing states among Muslim voters, um, Michigan, Arizona, and Wisconsin. Um, and I think even just recently, the abandoned Harris movement also uh, endorsed Jill Stein. Um, are, the, are the Democrats today realizing the magnitude of the anger towards them because of Gaza? Yeah, I don't think they really have. I think they recognize that they have a problem. And they recognized months ago that they had a problem, but I think they still think they have a messaging problem. When what they have is a policy problem. And unless they are willing to actually change policy or signal that a new uh, Harris administration would change policy, um, 
I don't think they're going to solve that problem. Now, I understand it's 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 hard to know how much of an impact this ultimately will make on the election. Again, they clearly seem to have come to the analysis um, that its impact will will be small. Um, I don't know if they're right about that. They may, may well be, but the point I've always made is that even if the impact of Gaza is marginal, this is an, an election that will be won or lost on the margins. Uh, this is a very it's close, close election. Yes. It is, we are a, a deeply and, and closely divided society. Um, as we saw in past elections, a few thousand or tens of thousands of votes in a few key districts and states could really swing the election. Um, and if you have, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of, of Muslim or Arab voters or even other voters of other groups who just are really outraged about Gaza, um, it could make a real difference. And it's not just in the voting booth. I think part of the problem here is it's not just that people will or won't vote uh, for Harris. Um, it's will they do the work of getting out the vote? Will they have spent the previous weeks and months knocking on doors, doing the phone banking and volunteering that is necessary to maximize turnout? And this is where in my conversations with state level uh, organizers, they have really seen an impact because this is an area that where you know, where young people in particular um, are, 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 are really important because the young people tend to have a bit more free time to volunteer. Um, and do some of this work, and they were just not seeing those numbers. Now, I think that was improved somewhat um, when Harris became the candidate. They were in real trouble with Biden as the candidate. It's, we've seen some improvement under Harris um, because there was an opportunity. You know, she was she was not the one in charge of this policy, though, of course, part of the administration. Um, so, again, I've not heard much about how this problem has been improved. I suspect there has been some improvement, but I know it's still a concern. And, and what do you make of the notion of a protest vote? You know, those who tell you that, you know, we're willing to endure another four years of Trump, um, but in, in, in exchange for teaching the Democrats a lesson and not having Kamala Harris in the White House. Um, I understand that. I've heard that claim. I think the costs of another Trump term, another uh, Trump administration are enormous. Um, and again, as someone who shares the anger um, at the Biden administration for this policy. I get where that is, is coming from. Um, I know it's an attractive argument that, well, if we, if, you know, if we deliver a loss to the Democrats, they will start paying closer attention um, to, to these ideas, these values, to this constituency. I honestly don't think it will work out that way. You don't think um, so? But that's, I, it, it's hard for me to see, you know, how that, you know, I think this argument has been made um, time, you know, in the past, um, it's rare, it's hard for me to think of any situation where this loss has redounded to the benefit um, of the left, um, of of human rights activism. Um, but I do think it's, and again, acknowledging the pain that people are experiencing, I, I really think when you look at the, you know, the kind of whole range of policies that Donald Trump and J.D. Vance have already promised, that, that they would that they would try to implement, you know, from mass deportation on down. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, if you don't think that U.S. policy in the Middle East could get worse, it definitely could get worse. And I realize that is, you know, simply, you know, dangling the danger of Donald Trump is not in itself um, a, a political argument. But I, I think people should consider that serious. Yeah, I just I don't think it's resonating as much with those who say that they want to, you know, use their protest vote. I don't, you know, I think they've already, they already that. see it as, as the worst it could possibly get to. Yeah. And again, I, I, I totally understand that. I think that it's a, it's a very legitimate feeling in the face of this catastrophe. It is it's just mind boggling. Yeah. Um, I'm, we're coming towards the end of our conversation here. Uh, I just got a couple more questions for you. Um, in, in March 2024, a Gallup poll found that 55% of Americans disapprove of Israel's actions in Gaza. Now, about you know, in, in terms of the shift in American public opinion, I mean, do you see the shift holding? Do you think it could even reshape, um, or should it reshape the U.S.-Israeli mm. relationship in the future? Well, I think it, it it could and it should. I mean, these are the expressed views of a majority of voters, and I think a, close to a supermajority of Democratic voters. Um, 
But again, the question with these kinds of polling, there's the key question of what do you think? But, you know, following up with what's called the intensity question of how much do you actually care? Um, you know, to what extent will you actually base your vote um, on this expressed, you know, opinion? Um, would you deny your vote to a member of Congress who did not share these views? Um, would you punish a, a member of Congress who who did the opposite of what you want? And I think that is part of, you know, the question, you know, what still remains to be seen. Um, I do think it's it's pretty clear that Americans want a, a less militaristic foreign policy. I think they see, you know, the reflection of, of chaos in the Middle East. And I think this is partly something that Donald Trump effectively exploited, um, you know, in 2016, back when he, you know, back in the during the 2016 primary when you had like 20 20 candidates up there on stage with him and he said you know the iraq war was a huge disaster um the only people who hadn't gotten that memo yet were on that stage with him i mean americans very broadly i think share that idea that our foreign policy elites had failed um on a whole range of things on trade on economics on security on um keeping them safe and keeping their their communities safe and prosperous um so again, I think it it remains to be seen whether we're going to be able to kind of marshal this changing public opinion uh, in a way that actually changes Congress, that changes policy. Certainly, there are there are you know interests on the opposing side that are hard at work pouring tens of millions of dollars into primaries to make sure that Democrats don't have a, a congressional uh, delegation that actually reflects the views of the party. Um, but again, not to not to keep uh, using this this you know, same line, but this is part of the work we have to do. And, and for my last question, Matt, I want to end on a, on a personal note. You mentioned earlier in our chat um, about, you know, as you were growing up, you actually had to actively learn about Palestinian history in, in the region. I mean, can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, well, part of my, you know, understanding the region differently is, one is I had a very close friend in high school whose whose family whose father was from Iraq, so he was Iraqi American. Um, just to this day, one of my my oldest and closest friends, and I just had the real privilege of being very close with his family. Our our band practiced in their basement, so I got to spend a lot of time over at their house. Um, but you know, just seeing the kind of stuff around their house, talking to his father, um, that mattered. To me a lot and then also interestingly when i was in college and i spoke to a a professor who was actually himself a kind of liberal progressive evangelical who in discussing israel palestine he was one of the first people who was really like yeah there's there's so much that we're we're just not told about in understanding this region and then of course having the opportunity you know reading on my own but of course going and seeing israel palestine for myself there's really nothing there's no substitute for that right um so again, it's I was lucky to be exposed to certain ideas and certain individuals, but also just having a real interest. And I think just being raised, again, in to believe that all people have value um, and trying to take that approach to my own understanding of the world in general has, has been part of that process. Yeah. And we'll leave it here. Matt Dust, thank you so much for speaking to us on Real Talk. I appreciate you taking the time. Really glad to. Thanks very much.